Okay, do you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yeah, okay. Wait, this is the most important part. The um, yeah, thanks. So we map uh, essentially this is the layout of the of, of, of the actual superconducting superconducting device, and uh, we uh, just essentially map here in the pink. This correspond to the sites where, that they can hold a spin up a fermion, and in the purple ones, they are the sites that can hold a spin down fermion. So this is essentially the the qubits that can hold information about the different the different electrons. This is in a, in, in a one by eight uh, uh, geometry, and of course also as as, as Eugene was mentioning, here we have just the connectivity is. Uh, so essentially, we can do two qubit gates by using these uh, uh, links between these circuits. So, for example, with this initial configuration, it's not possible to do the on-site interaction between one uh, down and one up. So, in order to do that, what we what we do is essentially apply a, what's called a fermionic swap gate. It essentially, swaps the information of this one down here. So, the the, the swap is applied between these two guys. We swap, so essentially that amounts to swapping the information of that is here up to this um, qubit, and we do that all across the, the, the chip. Mm -hmm. And then after that layer of swaps, we are able essentially just by using a local uh, two qubit gate to apply interaction, the on site interaction, which is, uh, I think, it's, it's the red one. And then we swap back. And now we are able to apply just, just again using a single cube, uh, sorry, two qubit gate, the hopping term between uh, first the, between the uh, odd and even uh, sites, and then between the even and odd sites. Right? The boundary conditions were open boundary. Yes, this is open boundary conditions. We can also we we also try it for again it's getting ah. sorry for the two by two by four again uh, with the same layer but now this uh, qubit represent just another ordering so we are looking now at a different geometry so again here. On top of being of, 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 on, on top of needed, needing the fermionic swaps to essentially arrange the information in the qubits to be at the neighboring sites because of the layout of the cube of, of the device, we also needed to do that because the Jordan Wigner string generates mm -hmm. some terms that actually are local in the fermionic language, they become non-local in the qubit language. Because remember, we have to map the uh, fermion, the fermions into qubits. And for example, using this uh, zigzag string, this interaction that is local in the fermions becomes a, a, like a, um, it has a X and X on the ends, but also a string of sets in the middle. So in order to deal with those as well, it's good to use this fermionic swap. So essentially it, it's, it's, it's used to, to essentially um, kill two birds, essentially the, the, that we don't have a, uh, very good connectivity in the device, mm -hmm. but and also we don't have uh, with the when we go beyond one dimension, we also have to deal with these la large uh, weight operators. Uh, uh, any question? Right. So the BQE part, as, as I just uh, flashed it uh, before, it has a, a classical optimization part. So we just measure the energy. And then we vary the parameters, we measure the energy again, and we have to essentially find in this landscape that depends on the parameters, we have to find the minimal energy, right? So that means that we have to do some type of gradient descent. And we introduce another algorithm that essentially does that using some base information about their previous measurements that goes as follows. So locally, we assume that the, en that the energy landscape is, is a quadratic function. And, uh, but it's, uh, this quadratic function depends on some parameters and these parameters are, are, are unknown at the beginning. So we sample the, we, we sample the, this uh, landscape around like some, some points randomly. 
And uh, with the, that information, we essentially using the base rule, we can just update the belief that we have on those parameters. So we continue to do that essentially and perform gradient descent on the analytical model instead of doing it um, numerically. And uh, yeah, for the ones that uh, probably know, this is can be understood as a Kalman set it was just used to. This is part of the classic. This is part is completely classical. So it takes the information, the measurements from the device, and it's performed classically. Yeah. Then it just the parameters fed into the Exactly. So this um, uh, variational quantum uh, eigen solver algorithm, it's uh, what people call it a hybrid. hybrid. Gets information from the quantum, but it, it processes it classically and then fits it back into the quantum machine. Of course, we have to do a lot of error mitigation because currently the devices are very, very noisy. We use some uh, error mitigation that, for example, uh, amounts to have some low level um, optimizations, for example, using the native gates in the device, which are like a square root I swap, a particular two qubit gate that is very, very well fitted, that it's implemented not natively in the device. So essentially all the two qubit interactions, we mapped it into this gate times a single qubit unitaries. And also using this type of low level twirling, which is essentially, if imagine that you, if the circuit was perfect, this gate commutes with these X gates. So this will do nothing. But if, if, if some, let's say, uh, error that is e to the i set appears here, in here, this type of circuit will kill it because this will just negate. Mm -hmm. So this type of uh, error mitigation, to, we, we, we show that there is actually very, very good to, to extract a meaningful signal for, from, the, from the problem. And that's what we call spin echo. Of, of course, we also pick good qubits and optimize the quantum circuit for doing that. And from on the physics side, we also use the symmetries of the Fermi Hauer model to essentially uh, symmetrize all the bit strings that we are getting out from the device using lat lattice reflection symmetry, particle hole symmetry, also po po post selecting over like we know how many electrons we created at the beginning and we measure at the end and we have different number of electrons we discard that run because of course there, there was an error in the in the in that run. Yes. So we do measure, we, we, we prepare the system and we measure, we get a bit string out and we do that again and again and again and again. And for the, for the physics one that I mentioned, over all the, that, that, those big strings, for example, for example, post selecting by total number, total number, we just discard the yeah this is in in the circuit so right so it's in every other one yeah. yeah so it increases the number of of a uh, single qubit gates we have to apply all these x gates and uh, we essentially we, we, we saw that okay we can pay that overhead because it's actually it's uh, um, it produces better results. So that, that's a bit counterintuitive because in, in, at the beginning you just think, okay, we want just to minimize the number of gates, but sometimes you want to add a bit more gates to kill some of the error. Of course, there will be errors in the error mitigation circuit itself. Yes, yes, yes. So exactly. So, so that, that, that's a good thing. So eventually, people want to think about error, uh, full error correction when you are above, above a threshold, and that essentially you can correct your system faster than you introduce errors, but we are not in that error regime yet. Uh, so these error mitigation techniques essentially is a bit of also actually try it and we see if it's, if, if do they work or not. This is fixing phase errors between particular pairs of qubits. Yeah. And how do you choose which ones you want to fix the phase errors between? Or, uh, you can't do it locally, of course. But... So for, for, for what we did here, we did everywhere because the, the belief is that essentially the, the, the machine has some uh, particular like error. It, it's, it's biased to, towards some errors that we think they are of the type of E to the I set. So it has a bit of coherent, coherent error in the set um, direction. But in, in general, to, to, to decide this, you have to, to do some type of, of 
you have to understand a bit what's happening on at, with errors in the machine, which is actually very difficult. I don't think that even, that even the providers know like, up to full detail what's going on. Uh, other other gates, other gates, yeah. We also applied uh, another technique that we developed uh, in the company, which uh, we call it uh, training with Fermion linear optics. Which actually the idea is is actually quite nice. The so for example, when the Fermi Haber model, I, I show you the circuit. Uh, if you just uh, take the parameters for the on-site interactions to zero. The, the circuit is uh, classically simula simulable because it's just free fermion, right? So that's uh, efficient. We can efficiently estimate the energy for those uh, in those uh, instances, and we can also measure the energy in the device for those instances. That produces essentially an error, an error map between what we get from the device and we, what we should be getting uh, exactly. And so essentially we characterize that error map, which is essentially linear here. And then we can invert this error map to use it in the instances which are not easily um, simulable. And we find that actually this particular error mitigation technique is great to, um, to get uh, more accurate energy. How do you know this works on the So that very good point. So we don't know that it, 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 it works, but essentially the idea again is that we apply the same circuit so with the gate with the parameter u equals to zero but the gate is there and we apply it and we uh, get the result and then we compare with what we get and you will see for example just uh, let me show you what we get so here on the on the right is the energy of the energy error here's between so as, as i have been mentioning the um, the number of layers that we can apply in this device is uh, just one variational layer. So just we apply all the terms of the Hamiltonian just once, right? So it's, it doesn't produce a, a, a lot of entanglement. So and here we compare the energy of that uh, doing that exactly, right, with what we get from the device. The um, the blue line is essentially just post selecting on the correct occupation number. Right, so we do the experiment. We look. We look. At, it's a bit string. We look at the number of ones. If that matches what we input, we keep it. If it doesn't match, we throw it away. Just do, doing that. Just do, doing that. The things are not very good, right? But applying the, the, the different uh, error mediation techniques, so training with the, the fermion linear optics, um, symmetrizing using the symmetries of the Hamiltonian, applying this spin echo, and also using particle hole symmetry. Um, we can essentially lower the energy, sorry, lower the error between what it should be the correct energy for that uh, number of layers and what we are getting from the device. What, why, why is your initial error I think just because the, the the system is very noisy, so it, for example, doesn't conserve particles for symmetry per se. Although the Hamiltonian, you, you have this particle symmetry between low and high. This seems uh, to be an intrinsic error. It's in one direction. So yeah, so that that's a whole area that we are investigating because it's um, the, the actual the actual device is, is is a physical device. It's made of qubits that, for example, maybe maybe bias to be more in the zero so it state. Doesn't have a natural in the system, it doesn't. Right. Uh, how much time do I have? Well, we can discussion now. Okay. Okay. And let me just uh, show the results. Um, uh, uh, unless there are any other questions. So yeah, these are in units of of of, uh, of Hopin. So I, I said t equals to one. So u is uh, whenever you see u, if you like this u over t. Right. So uh, he, here, so before we, we sh I, I show you the error, which is uh, between what's supposed to be the the correct energy. 
for that la one layer and the what, what we see is essentially of the order of 0 0.5 for the when we have all the error mitigation techniques mm -hmm. and as, as, mm -hmm. as you correct, correctly point out because the scale here gets amplified for, for larger occupations this error gets uh, it seems smaller but yeah you're right there is uh, so here in this inset we see the difference between the true ground state for this um, system and what we get from BQE. Uh, so, uh, is it that you the yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a few percent, uh, but I think that the main uh, message from this slide is essentially we can see that we can do better than any, uh, let's say, mean field theory here, which is uh, essentially we optimize over all possible grounds that are just one slater determinant. And this, even just with one layer of BQE, we can do better than that. Okay, so it's not great, but still it's surprising that with all these errors, we can still get something which is actually better than any possible classical approximation. And this is uh, for one times four, uh, for this small ladder, and also for one, sorry, this, that was one times eight. And one times four, we also did it, but here, because the system is smaller, we can actually do it with two variational layers. And as expected, the, the, the energy is even better than having just one. Uh, gladly, we also, we also see some, so, some of the physics, for example, uh, we see uh, the, the, the mode transition around uh, occupation number eight, which is a uh, half filling. Um, for either u equals four and u equals eight, uh, and yeah, something that we have to look further. That is, although this is uh, compelling in one D, in two D the results are less less conclusive. So um, yeah, that's why we we don't, we don't show them. Let me just flash. We also see anti ferromagnetic order. Uh, but again, for example, compare the true ground state, which is the blue one, with the what we see from the experiment. So we see some anti-permagnetic order, but essentially it's dampened. So it's getting more or less the correct physics, but the, not, it's not quantitatively co correct. Uh, also for the two times four. And uh, regarding the, the charge densities, we also see that the behavior is, is uh, surprisingly similar to the correct uh, ground state, but there are some features that we are missing. So the main point, and let me finish with this, is that, um, so it, surprisingly, even with a very low depth, so it's, it's just one or two uh, variational layers, we can get some qualitative uh, insights into the, the Hubble model. That, that's surprising per se. Uh, but of course we have, the, 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 I think the main message is that we, because the, the, the system is very, very noisy, we have to uh, consider a lot of error mitigation techniques for this to be, to, to have some, to get, to extract some sensible physics out of the system. And in order to essentially do something better than can be done with Monte Carlo or all the, the classical methods, we need to, um, we, we need to have a better, better hard, hardware. Is we, we, what we have now, and probably this year, uh, probably will be very difficult. Let me ask you something. You, you've done a 16 site of, of two by eight. Yeah. Uh, would it be hard to do four by four? Would you have to snake the I, I, snake, snake, snake your uh, string back and forth? I, I don't think it. it, it well, let me see. on geometry, I, I guess, is what I'm asking. Right. So, is one D easier than square? It is. Yeah. It is because you have to do less uh, swaps, these right. fermionic swaps. Right. Yeah. Also, in particular, if we will. If we would, we would use this particular device for doing uh, four times four, yes. then because this, the, the geometry of the device, as I showed, you cannot fit 
four by four directly. So you will have to fit it in another way, and then you have to go even more swaps because this, the geometry the geometry doesn't uh -huh. do not match. So so you say scalable, but probably as you start to go to more and more sites in two dimensions or three dimensions, uh, uh, the necessity of tips winding your string over wild wild durations will probably cause you problems. Right. Very good, very good, very good point. So we did some. There are some other ways of mapping fermions to qubits, mm -hmm. right? So we developed something which is called the, the compact encoding, which is essentially physically you can understand it. Essentially, if you take two toric codes and you put them together, right, and you gap out the the E and M in, uh, excitations, you just get a ground state which is just composed of uh, fermions that do not cost you any any energy. So essentially, that gives you a map. But that's the physical way of just understanding a, a algebraic map between uh, fermions and uh, qubits. That actually, with that, we can keep the, the the weight of the qubit operators just very very small. Essentially, it's like they up to weight four, but you have to pay that you have to add and still a qubit. So that's that's how we see it going into the future. Like we have probably access to larger devices. The fidelity is probably will not improve as much. Hopefully, they will improve a bit more. But maybe I, okay, maybe I, I'm wrong. But I, I, we see that essentially qubits will be something a resource that we will have. Fidelities, not so much. So essentially, spending qubits in, uh, for example, doing this encoding that uh, allows you to not have to do these long strings will be a very good um, strategy. Questions? Yeah. Yes. You cannot do more. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Since I don't understand everything, I can ask questions. Please. Here slide of two by four. Um, trying to understand your mapping. Um, Oh, the results. Yes, I thought that the difference between one by eight and two by eight, uh, we can start to see the book diagonal. Um, so this mapping is uh, is taken at a particular time, or who is that mapping? Which mapping? Sorry. That the uh, color is with red and blue. The you know, the sphere is the color. So yeah, so here we use the same is this this uh, mapping. You mean the so this following the same order of the Jordan Binner string that I showed before, uh -huh. right? So it's going like as a snake through the system, right? And and this is the the, the ordering on in the ground state or in in our approximation of the ground state. And colors are representing Right, so it's between minus one and one, so essentially this is either things pointing up or down. Oh, just that. Uh, so, okay, all right. So it's just a uh, correlation. So. Yeah, so it's spin, 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 yes, spin spin correlation. Because, uh, okay, so I thought that you can measure entanglement between a two site, if it's a Heisenberg or the, on a chain or a ladder based on by four or on by four. Um, it's like a measuring a bell pair. No, no, so this is just measuring just this is just measuring the spin, the, the, the expectation value of the spin, okay. right? We, we didn't measure the, the entanglement, which amounts essentially to measuring different bases. It's a bit more more complicated, but the. Why they ordering What? It's a one by eight. I don't know why it orders even. So this is one by eight, but this is two by four. So the ordering is a bit different because we go as the Jordan Bringer string. So is it correlation? This is not long range order. Exactly. So that's what I meant. Oh, uh, okay. You're, you're not measuring order. No, no, no. This is this is correlation, spin spin correlation. Yes. And that means that you are measuring a single pair, which are called in the language of Bell pair. So you're measuring an entangled pair, and that can signal like a and minus with the blue and red. Yeah, so I, I, 
Anyway, so. Right, we are missing the spin at, at a one and speed and j. Yes. Yeah, so and the expectation of that. Yes. Yeah. And you can actually switch on and off by the time one is too. Okay. So yeah, just a very general question. Um, given that you're working with it, how long do you think it will be before we can do something we don't know? That's a very good question. And um, yeah, we're working actively on that. I yeah, think technology is improving dramatically. Well, see, but still, people always say it's twenty years off, as they've been saying for the last forty years. I think it's it. But maybe okay. We can discuss that over, 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 over a bit later. Yeah, but yeah, uh, <laughs> essentially, I I I, I, close. I do believe that it's getting close. Yeah, yes. I mean, from what you're doing, it looks like it's getting closer than many of us think it is. We, I, I think if, if we have, uh, if we get to a regime that we have a thousand qubits and fidelities, fidelities of um, one order of magnitude more, very interesting things will start to happen. Two questions. Let's say if I want to know the round state with this sectors, what is the fidelity that we have? Can you just without the constraint scaling? So we had some numerical results doing exactly that for small systems. And we believe that getting a fidelity of like 9.9, .9, sorry, 0 0.99. The, the fidelity, yes, you need of the order of uh, 500 gates for a five by five uh, Fermi Hubbard model. And right now the is 50. That's the number of gates. Uh, here we're talking about the circuit depth, which is different. It's like how many lay different layers you can. Yes, right. Yeah. And For. For five by five. Yeah. So yeah, uh, the number of layer, the number of gates, I don't have it in the top of my head, but okay. probably like ten times that. Okay. Yeah. Your interest in the gram set. Why not use it to translate the invariance? Um. Well, he, here we don't have the proper translational invariance because we have open boundary conditions, right? Which you're forced to have by using the Golden Gate. Well, no, not not really. Necessarily. Not really. Yeah. But then there will be a problem with the project boundary condition that man has to plot to the last the first one you have to plot to the last one. Exactly. And exactly. That would be also a high cost because of this one. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. why to lose the translation variance that you gain the high to that is of long range. Exactly. Yeah. And also you can think you can, for example, go to momentum space and have instead of uh, starting a the fermions are representing occupation in real space, they could represent occupation in momentum space, but then your interaction part becomes very non-local, so you pay there the problem. Thank you. One last, which is the last question. Uh, Yeah, so I look at chains. Yeah, yeah, I think there is a bit touch at that point. So essentially, the answer is we do for that case, we do need better components. We know that we create one of those. And it's exactly that. So you just uh, map your fermions into the subspace of a larger uh, qubit system. And you measure parity uh, stabilizers there. And you can just uh, do that not to pay this large, uh, you don't create this large operator weights. Operator. Well, I think Barry Jerry is also it also in the sense here. Right. 
Right, right, right. Do you need more answers? No. Maybe we can. This sounds like a discussion for the Jack Horner. The word. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Very, very stimulating talk, and that closes us for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone in Zoom.